Thank you. Thank you very much. One, one, one. Is this, uh, is this working? Good afternoon. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You know, it's a real joy for me to be here today. Um, the, the purpose of my talk today is a combination of leadership and coaching. And I am not here to impress. I am, however, here to express, to express my feelings, my thoughts, my understanding of how today, the world we live in, there is such a need for leadership and for coaching. I, I feel that today we are blessed, all of us. We are living in the greatest time of all mankind. I will make a prediction. I predict that in the next seven years, the world will change more than in the last 80 years put together. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And I'll give you my reasons why. So therefore, if we are in, about to enter a world of change, the need for leadership is more than ever. The need for coaching is more than ever. What do I do? I do many things, but my love, what I have dedicated my life to is coaching. That's what I do, it's what I live, it's what I eat, it's what I breathe. I absolutely love what coaching will do because coaching changes people. It helps them to build and grow and expand and create and to be all that they can be. Coaching is something whose time has come. Coaching is an initiative that the world needs and it is here. So today we're going to talk about corporate and executive coaching, the key to employee and organizational growth. Fortune magazine said two years ago, People don't leave companies, they leave managers. And that is so true in many, many cases. But I will tell you what people do not leave. They do not leave inspiring leaders. Inspiring leaders keep their people. Not every manager keeps their people. So, today we're going to cover leadership and coaching. And we'll talk about what's happening in the world. We'll talk about trends and techniques and methodologies and so on. But first of all, let's talk about leadership. Now, why is leadership important? And you, ladies and gentlemen, as HR professionals, you are leading the charge. You are right at the front. You are right at the battlefield. And your job is not just to develop leaders. Your job is to become leaders. Why is that? Because you see, in life, you cannot teach what you do not know. You cannot lead where you will not go. So if you want to develop leaders, you need to be leadership quality yourself. That is non-discussable, non-negotiable. So leadership, what, what do we know about leadership? Well, we know that today, there are 300 different definitions of leadership. We know that today on Amazon, there are over 1,000 different books on leadership. And many of them conflict and they contradict. Companies today talk about leaders. They, want, they all want leaders. And they don't just want normal leaders. Some companies want thought leaders. Others company want tactical leadership, others want strategic leaders, and yet we don't really know a true definition of leadership. But here I've put four primary qualities that all leaders seem to have. And this is what you and I want to develop within our organizations, and this is what you need to develop within yourself to become one of the world's great HR leaders. In your role, in your company, in your community, in your country, and in the world. You owe it to yourself to become a great leader. So what do leaders have? Well, they have vision. They all have vision. And 
the vision to see beyond, the vision to look at themselves in a different way, the vision to look at their teams, their companies, their communities, their countries in a different way, their, the vision to, to look at themselves and see about wanting to be more, see more, have more, achieve more, and leave more, a legacy. What else do we know about great leaders? Communication, they all, are good at communicating. There were two great speakers of antiquity. One was a Roman, he was called Cicero. One was a Greek, he was called Demosticles. And in those days, they, we didn't have YouTube or Netflix, we didn't have iPads, and these were the great attractions of the time. And when these men spoke, Thousands would come to listen. The word would go out in the villages days and weeks before. And it was said of Cicero that when he spoke, men would stand in awe. They were awestruck. When Cicero spoke, men would stand in awe. And they would turn around to each other and they would say, boy, what a great speech. Wasn't that incredible? Oh, let, let's go to the, the tavern and have a beer and talk about that. That was worth coming for. So when Cicero spoke, men would stand in awe. When Demosticles spoke, men would say, let us march. Let us march. They were willing to go to war. They were willing to lay down their lives and die when that man spoke. So Cicero was good, but Demosticles was incredible. Men would die when he spoke. You see, as a leader, your job is to be able to communicate the vision, to communicate it well. There is no skill in the world like being able to reach out into someone's heart and to touch them, to touch them with your feelings and your words and to inspire those men and women. There is nothing like it. The ability to say it well, that is what we need to have. Next, being worthy of trust. What do we know of leaders? People trust them. They have honesty. They have a level of integrity. People look up to them and say, I will follow you because I believe in you and I trust you. And I don't just trust you for you, I trust you for me to do the best for me. And next, leaders are open-minded. They are not closed-minded. They are willing to learn and grow and improve and they're willing to change whenever they have to. So these are the qualities of leadership. Coaching. What do we know about coaching? Well, there are many key skill sets. One, of course, is communication. One of the great skills of coaching is the ability to say it well. Coaches empower. You see, coaches can do no harm. We can only empower people and give them back their own power. We help to raise awareness so people are aware of what is happening around them. Coaching is all about helping men and women take back responsibility for their lives and what is happening. And coaching, more than anything, helps men and women to get back in touch with their own true core values in here. You see, life is not about here. I promise you now, it's never about here. The important things in life are not about what you think. The important things in life are all here. It's what you feel. Feelings are everything. And coaching helps people get back in touch with their true core values and feelings. So what is it good for? Well, it's perfect for dealing with change. You've listened to many speakers over the last one and a half days. What was the one constant within all of their talks? The one thing every one of them mentioned was, we now live in a world of change. And it's going to get more. It's going to go like that. 
With change comes challenges. And coaching is perfect for helping men and women deal with challenges, deal with problems, deal with change. So, what do we know about coaching? Well, we know that it works. We know it works. We have got absolute mathematical figures now to back it up. We also know that it is mad. Coaching is mad. What does mad mean? It means it makes a difference. But it always makes a difference for the good. Coaching can never make a difference for the bad. We also know, and I know that you are in HR and, and people love figures, they love mathematical proof, and we have our ROI, return on investment. And it's not big. Co the return on investment in coaching is not big. It is huge and growing. So I'm going to spend some time showing you some facts and figures. I never normally do this, but I know that you are all going to get a copy of the PowerPoints, and I think it would be nice for you to have a copy for you to reflect on and use in your own company if you wish to. So, Harvard Business Review said, the goal of coaching is the goal of good management to make the most of resources. Metrics Global, worldwide organization, the bottom line, coaching achieved a 529% return on investment in just one of their examples. Here's some international findings. This is, you can look it up on Google, the Manchester Review, they looked at 300 companies worldwide, all over Europe, Middle East, Far East, America. And they looked at coaching. How did coaching impact in those organizations? And they looked at two results, the tangible and the intangible. And here are just some. I could fill 20 slides with this. Look at the ROI. On average, 5.7 times. Executive productivity went up 53%. This is the individual executives who received the coaching. Organizational strength improved by 48%. Quality improvements, 48%. Customer service, 39%. Here's the, next, the interesting one. Retaining good quality executives. You see, how, how do you get great managers? How do you get great leaders in your organization? Well, there are only two ways. Number one, you grow your own. Develop them within. But that takes time. It takes years. The only other way is to recruit. But I don't mean recruit. I mean headhunt. I don't mean headhunt. I mean steal. And that's what happens. Top companies are constantly stealing from each other. Talent management. I go to India. I work with India a lot. I'll give you an example. We work with a little company you won't have heard of called Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola are now training 700 of their managers in India to be coaches, internal coaches. And you go to India. India is an emerging market. And the top, top managers in the multinationals are moving company like this, like this, like this. And they are getting attracted by higher salaries, higher salaries, higher salaries. Did you know some of the top executives in India earn much more than their equivalent in Germany, in Austria, in America, in Japan? And yet India has a cost of living down here, but the top, top executives earn far more. Because the only way the companies can get them is to recruit headhunt to steal them and offer bigger and bigger incentives. So retaining quality leadership is so important. And coaching shows here that um, the retention went up over 30%. Supervisor uh, team relationships up 70%. Teamwork 67%. Working relationship 63 Job satisfaction 52 It goes on and on and on.
Look at the bottom line. It's the bottom line that's the most important sentence here. Most of that was achieved with a total of between four, five, six, or seven coaching sessions with the executives or with the teams or with the individuals. We're not talking a two-year program. We're not talking something that took meeting after meeting after meeting over many months. Six or seven individual two-hour coaching sessions. That's pretty incredible. The ability to make those figures, those changes in an organization in such a short, precise time is amazing. I'll give you one case study and then we'll move on. This is a particular large multinational company. The executive team were coached, the C-suite. The team coaching program took 10 months, but only six meetings with the individuals. 12 people were on the worldwide board. They were senior managers with more than 10 years experience, and the lowest earning one, the lowest, was earning over 100,000 euros per annum as a minimum. So we're talking top-level managers. The average impact on the board decisions, every decision they made after the coaching initiative, they believe increased the revenue to the company by 1 million euros more than it would have previously. That's pretty incredible. Each and every decision after that. The estimated return on investment was 750%. And don't forget, they only had six meetings with each individual. And here are the measurable results that they got. Okay. Time effectiveness up 78%. The, the, the board meetings were so more efficient after that. Being able to make decisions up 66%. The quality of those decisions up over 50%. The impact, 44. Here's the interesting one. The willingness to share information. You see, a lot of people make the mistake that information is power. And if I have it, I'm more powerful than you. And, and I will keep it. it. It's like, you know, the Lord of the Rings, Gollum, he says, it's my precious. No one is getting it. It's mine. And after the coaching, people were willing to share so they communicated, they collaborated more. Managerial risks, people were willing to take risks. The degree of delegation, up 54%. Here's the lovely one, stress. People's internal stress in the country. I know none of you feel stress, do you? No, of course not. <laughs> but stress went way down. And profit sharing went way up. So all in all, wonderful. Now let's look at the world. So we've seen that coaching works. We now have a changing world. We have young, dynamic populations. I was doing some work for Nigeria uh, recently. We, we work in uh, over 30 countries now. And in Nigeria, the population is 170 million. 62% are under 24 years of age. 62% of the whole country is under 24 years of age. 62% so under 24, it's a young country. We're living in a young world. Here in the Balkans, have you noticed over the last 15 years the youth bulge coming up. We live, you live in a young country. The future belongs to the young, whether you like that or not. It's the way it is. We have technology driving change. And you know, you all know the technology we're talking about. Telephones, webinars, Skype, smartphones, social media, cost cutting, and being aware of our impact in the world. These are all having a huge change and they're real. They're not something that you talk about that might happen 
It's real and it is here and it is now. Mo all countries in the world are in change. It, the only question is in what state? They are in various stages of demographic transition. 50 years ago, the population of this world was 3 billion. Today, it is over 7 billion. We have over doubled the population in one lifetime, less than a lifetime. Where are all those young men and women going to work? How will we employ them? How will we give them careers that make them feel meaningful? David Bloom talks about the, the youth bulge moving through the world right now. I was in Cairo a short while ago. Cairo has many universities. One university alone in Cairo, one, has 200,000 students. That's the size of a city. There are cities of 200,000. So we have this huge change in the world. Rapid, it's rapid, younger workforce, moving up the value chain, increasing mobility, and people will move. They'll move quicker than they ever would before. Positive impact on globalization. Business itself is having to change. Things are becoming less personal. The old ways are not working, and this is very, very important. You can no longer say, well, that's always the way we've done it here. This is how we run our company. We've done it for 20 years. That won't work. We have knowledge workers. We have managers today running teams, and they have no idea what some of the people in their teams do. No idea. Because they're not skilled to the same level. We have a flattening of hierarchies. We have virtual teams. My organization, we're a worldwide organization, we have hundreds and hundreds of people. Our head office now, our head office, has got people in America, India, Bangladesh, Ukraine, Romania, and the Philippines. And they are all part of our head office team. And we meet almost every day by webinars and Skype. This is the way things are going. I did a talk to a university in Warsaw, uh, literally two months ago. Um, I'm on the faculty of a number of universities, and, and I was talking to a lot of the professors. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you some harsh information. Let me help you to, we, we use a phrase in, in, in business. We say, it is crucial you face the brutal facts. Crucial, face the, or confront the brutal facts. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, here's some facts for you. It is absolutely guaranteed there are people in the world who are better at your job than you are. And they are willing to do it cheaper. Now, they did not like that. A lot of people in the audience went, I, I'm a top professor. And I said, yeah, it means nothing. Honestly, it means nothing. There are people in this world who can do your job better than you and probably cheaper. And we need to get aware of that. Stanford University in January launched the first ever MBA completely distance learning. Totally, utterly, 100% distance learning. And they are now marketing it in India, in China, all over the world, and you never have to go to Stanford. And you can get an executive MBA. And they have lecturers from all over the world who deliver the lectures by webinar, no longer face-to-face -face in a classroom. The world is changing, ladies and gentlemen. And we're driven by consumerism more and more and more. So, this is just talking about the benefit of personal coaching, distance coaching, and how it's just as effective by doing it on Skype or telephone as it is face-to-face. -face. So, there's two types of manager ladies and gentlemen. Traditional, 
And the phrase we use for that is command and control. Traditional management using command and control. Or we have coaching. And coaching style management is rising. One of the most successful CEOs in the world today, he runs a little company called Google, called Eric Schmidt. You can go onto YouTube. And he has said publicly last year, there's a video of him saying, every manager in the world should have a coach. Every manager in the world should have a coach. It will help you to become better than you have ever thought possible. It will take you to new heights. Leaders, leadership is all about coaching style of management, not command and control. So we now have these trends coming together. Coaching, did you know coaching is the second fastest growing industry in the world today? Second fastest. Number one is IT, hardware, software, that's going like a, a volcano. But coaching at this moment is number two. We have mobility, we have sharing, we have working online, we have international focus, we have a young world, we have outsourcing, we have worldwide competition now that we never had before. Lenovo, who's heard of Lenovo? Yep, every hand goes up. The third largest computer company on the planet doesn't have a corporate headquarters anymore. They got rid of it last year. Their executives orbit the globe. Their office is their hotel room and their laptop. Two in every five IBM employees have no office. 20 years ago, that would have been unthinkable. Ram Charan, one of the top management consultants in the whole wide world, if you want Ram to come into your company, it's 50,000 a day minimum, dollars, that is. He's 67. He bought his first house that he ever owned last year. He has spent 25 years living in hotel rooms. Now, personally, I think that's, ugh, I wouldn't like that. But, and he has written some of the best books in the world on consulting. And he's done it all from hotel rooms. Every week, Polish surgeons commute to the city of Nottingham. I know, because my son is a doctor in Nottingham. And they, um, they work Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. They fly back 6 a.m. to Warsaw Monday morning to work in the Warsaw Hospital. That would have been unthinkable 20 years ago. People travel all over for low cost every reason. And because of that, we now have new models, new coaching methods and tools and systemic coaching and uh, wonderful instruments aimed at managers, aimed at teams, aimed at increasing the, the effectiveness. For example, one is the coaching circle we use all over the world. There are also now huge methods and tools coming in for group coaching where you can coach whole teams together effectively. So the world is changing, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to tell you now about some of those changes. And I'm telling you not to frighten you, but to help you to understand the need for real leadership today. I made a prediction. The world will change in the next seven years more than in the last 80. There are six reasons. Number one, autonomous vehicles. Who's heard about autonomous vehicles? Come on, hands up. Yeah, and electric vehicles and all that. Of course you have. I don't think anyone really understands the impact this is going to happen, or have. The following companies are working on it right now. Tesla, Google, Amazon, Apple, Uber, Lyft, Volkswagen, Ford, and others. They are so advanced, so advanced, Within the next few years, autonomous driving vehicles will be in some of the major cities in the world, and then they will flow out to all the others. Uber. Who's heard of Uber? I love Uber. Whenever I'm in a place that has Uber, I get Uber instead of a taxi. I don't have to worry about having the right change. I don't have to worry about tipping. I don't have to worry about them taking me around the wrong, long way. It's a joy, and they are cheaper than taxis. Quicker, faster, safer, more efficient, and cheaper. I love Uber. 
Uber have just put in an order for 100,000 cars from General Motors to be delivered in five years' time. And those cars are to be self-driving cars. Uber have made a commitment in February of this year. The owner stood up and he said, our aim is twofold. Number one, to be the largest taxi company on the whole world. And number two, to get rid of every driver. And he, they have predicted the cost of Uber will come down by another 70%. It's already cheaper than taxis. It will drop by 70%. Why would you ever own a motor car? Why? When you can call, get your app, you call a car, it takes you to the supermarket, you send it away, you go and do the shopping, you come out with your bags, call your car, it arrives, no driver, takes you home. Pleasure, magic, without, and literally for half the cost of an equivalent bus ticket, an immediate personal service. Why would you ever have the hassle of buying a car for thousands, servicing it, repairing it, taxing it, insuring it, when the cost of ownership is going to drop, or the cost of using? Right, because of this, the autonomous technology for lorries, big trucks, is further advanced. The cost of equipping a huge 18-wheel truck and making it totally autonomous is now $18,000. What is the biggest cost to a, a haulage firm, a logistics company? What's the biggest cost? The salaries of the driver. They're all going to go, ladies and gentlemen. In America, there are 183,000 employed drivers. Within seven years, most of them will be gone. They all have husbands, wives, children, mortgages, food to buy. What's going to happen? How will they do that? How many taxi drivers are in New York, San Francisco, London, Berlin, Paris, Madrid? I don't know. Tens and tens and tens of thousands. How many taxi drivers are in Skopje? Thousands. Yeah. What happens when they go? When it all becomes autonomous? How do they feed their families? And I don't have an answer. But I'm telling you now, it's coming. Whether you like it, whether you don't, we have a word, it's called a truism. A truism is something that, whether you like it, whether you agree, whether you don't agree, whether it's convenient or not, it's true. Autonomous vehicles are coming, and they're going to change the world. They believe that 50% of all car manufacturers within 12 years will be gone. 50%. Because you and I will no longer be buying cars if we can call one up whenever we need it and send it away. The people who will buy cars are the huge, huge taxi companies that will own thousands of them, but no drivers. So that's happening. At the same time, we have robotics. Factories are becoming roboticized, and they no longer need to employ the same amount of people that they have before. Heavy engineering, heavy manufacturing is now hugely progressing towards being completely automated. Donald Trump is wrong when he said he's bringing manufacturing jobs back. I promise you, he is wrong. There will be more manufacturing, but there will be less jobs. Because you do not need the same amount of people to produce more goods. Then we have something interesting. We have AI, artificial intelligence. Let me read you something. Elon Musk said last month, four weeks ago, that artificial intelligence is probably the most dangerous initiative ever for the human race. There is an organization called the McKinsey Global Institute. And in December last year, this is what they said. Artificial intelligence will have an impact on society that is over 
1,000 times more than the Industrial Revolution. Linked to artificial intelligence is deep learning. They have now managed to replicate many of the thought processes of humans, the way we learn. Just one little impact of this is what's called chatbots. Who's heard of chatbots? Yeah? Cisco, only you. Chatbots are, you will phone up a company, a lovely lady or man will answer, you will have a very engaging conversation, you will ask questions, they will give you answers, and you think you are talking to a human being. And you are not. You are talking to a computerized voice. They believe that within the next seven years, all multinational companies, their customer service department, and telesales will be chatbots. Why would you employ 20 people on a full-time salary manning the phone and give them an office and give them coffee breaks and give them all computers and give them all lighting and give them all electricity? Why would you do that when one powerful computer can do it all for you? Now, you can argue the rights and wrongs. You can argue the, the moral effect of this. But it's coming. Then we have 3D printing. There is um, the third biggest shipping company in the world is called Hainan. They went bankrupt in January. Right now they have over 200 ships sitting outside harbors all over the world. I was in Gibraltar in March. I went to the top of the hill. I didn't climb, I took the cable car. And um, outside Gibraltar there are 12 Hainan super tankers impounded. They won't allow them in because they can't afford the port fees and they're sitting there with thousands of uh, containers and they went bankrupt because logistics around the world is changing. Boeing announced last month that they are now 3D printing parts of their Dreamliner airplane and saving five million dollars per plane and these were parts they used to ship in from Japan and China. No longer need them. They're printing them on site. And two days ago, MIT, MIT two days ago made an announcement. They have invented a portable, huge 3D printing machine. It's almost as big as this room, and it moves. And they built the world's first ever house using 3D printing. Complete. Bedrooms, kitchens, lounge, bathrooms, foundations, walls, ceilings, roof, ready for a family to walk right in and live. They did it two days ago. Look it up on Google. But here's the interesting thing. It took 14 hours. They built the house with 3D printing in 14 hours at a cost of 12,000 US dollars. And that's the beginning. What's going to happen to construction? All the people involved in construction, if that happens around the world. Then we have automated drones, delivery. Amazon are now, they've got, Amazon were given a license in the United Kingdom to start delivering items by drone in the next four months, in limited areas to begin with. Do you think that might affect the delivery industry worldwide? Now, I said there were six. There's one more, the biggest of them all. It's called the blockchain revolution. Now, many of you will have heard of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the technology that sits behind them, the blockchain. And the blockchain is going to revolutionize the way that banking is done, insurance is transacted, the way we protect our own identity online, and it's going to have the most incredible impact. Hands up anyone here who knows anyone who works in the banking industry or the insurance industry. If you have a friend or a family, anyone at all, banking or insurance, 
would you please, please give them a message from me? Tell them to be very afraid. Now, I mean that nicely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get positive in a second. I own an insurance company. It's worldwide. It's one of the biggest in the world. And I know this. Insurance companies are going to cut 50% of all their staff in the next 10 years. So will banking because of blockchain. But all of this is happening. And you and I, we are blessed. We are blessed right now. We are living in the most exciting times the world has ever, ever seen. And with change comes challenges, but also another word. The word called opportunity. In 1983, an industry went completely kaput. It went out of business in six months. It was called the vinyl record industry. You're all too young. You, most of you have never even seen a vinyl record. And it was replaced by something called the CD. And within four years, the CD industry was employing worldwide three times more people than the vinyl record industry. So right now, we are on the cusp of the most amazing change. And there will be challenges, but there will be opportunities. Opportunities <clears throat> unlike anything we have ever seen. There will be new forms of transport. Elon Musk is working right now on this hyperlink. Up until now, for 200 years, there have only been four ways of transport travel, air, sea, road, and rail. He's inventing the hyperlink. They're building one right now in the UAE to test it. It's using magnetic technology. It will be so fast, so efficient. You can travel 2,000 miles in half an hour. That's coming, and that will employ millions of people worldwide. You see, leadership is funny. A real leader does it from the back. They don't stand in front. They do it back there. And they empower their people. And leadership is better when people barely know they exist. A good leader who talks little, and when his work is done, they will all say, we did it ourselves. So, finally, in the last two minutes, as HR leaders, you have a, an incredible role in the world. Your role is to help people to build and grow and expand and create. And I'll share with you something that my mentor, Jim Rohn, taught me many years ago. The four ifs that make life worthwhile. You see, Life is worthwhile. Life is worthwhile if you learn. You've got to learn, constantly learn. How do we grow? We only grow when we take in new ideas, new information, and new knowledge, and learning is, is exciting. And our job is to help people to learn. And life is worthwhile if you learn. Life is worthwhile if you try. You've got to try. You go to, I've got young children, you go to their school and they have their, their annual sports day and you see them out there competing and they're trying and their little faces and they're so motivated. And yet today, they're trying to remove competition from society. They're removing competition from schools. They're saying, oh, we shouldn't compete. It's not good. Let me help you. It is good. It is good to learn to, to compete. And how will you ever know? How will you ever know if you can do anything? You've got to try. Life is worthwhile if you stay. You've got to hang in there. You know, there's a book. There's a book, and I'm not an expert on this book, but it teaches us that, you, you, first of all, you sow, and later on you reap. You get the harvest. But in the middle, there's the hot days of summer. The hot days of summer come to try us. They come to test us. So you plant in the spring and you harvest in the autumn. But in the middle, life tests us. Can we hang, hang on in there? Do we have the intestinal fortitude to hang on and to stay? Do we have the idea and will we stay with that idea? And will we push it through 
and do everything we can. Life is worthwhile if you stay. And finally, life is worthwhile if you care. You've got to care. Caring is a basic human function. It's something we do. We care for the people we love, but it's, it's, more, it's just as important to care for the people you don't love, to care for the people you work with, with your colleagues, to care for who they are, to care for their dreams, to care for their goals, to help them become all that they can be, to reach out to those men and women with the power of your words, to reach deep into their heart, and to help them to know that you care. You see, I learned something many years ago. People don't care what you know until they know that you care. And this is what real leadership is all about. People don't care what you know until they know that you really care. Today, we're changing. It's coming. So we need leadership. And the benefit of coaching Coaching turns managers into leaders. Last one minute, what's the definition? A manager does things right, a leader does the right thing. And there's a difference. And I wish you all the most incredible lives that you could ever dream of. And I wish you all to become the most wonderful leaders in your field. And I wish you all the success that you're prepared to work for. Thank you. Thank you.